Right. Um, should we try and make a try and try and make a start? Is this going to Claire's Claire's nodding? Um, I know it's. Thank you very much for, uh, for 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 joining me for this uh, this session. Um, I'm always really keen in sort of events and situations like this to give people an opportunity to uh, to you know to sort of introduce themselves. But I'm conscious we've we've only got a short period of time. So if you could give the sort of briefest of um, sort of introductions, you know, a 15 second introduction, just to introduce yourself to your group, you know, to the group, uh, where you're from, uh, and maybe just a little bit of an insight into terms of, uh, of why you're interested in this uh, session. So I'll go around my screen and say, uh, John, John, if you mind starting. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm John. I'm John. I'm a, I'm a reader in our parish. <clears throat> and um, I'm, 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 I've, I've always been slightly, but not very deeply interested in, in, in environmental issues, um, in part because um, I think the scale of the changes that are required are, are uh, in my view, be, uh, given the people who are the main protagonists, largely beyond, beyond um, change, really. But, uh, but I'm, I'm very keen and interested in, the, in this possible, in the work that churches can do. Um, we have a, a typical church, which every time we light the boiler, you know, a couple of polar bears fall off an ice flow into the water. Uh, it's such a, <clears throat> you know, the um, we, we 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 have a, we have the sort of building which in in the winter is Arctic, and in the summer you you know you can you can fry eggs on the radiators. It's an, and I think to myself, this is probably not untypical of the buildings of the Church of England, and um, you know, so work to be done really. And um, I'm going to be doing some of that this year because I've been volunteering for a few committees where I can exert a little power and influence. Cool. Um, oh, that was a long 15 seconds, John. <laughs> sorry about I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely, no, you're absolutely fine. No, don't worry. Um, so let's, <coughs> let's, let's, let's um, so Alan, do you want to kind of quickly introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Monday, Staley Bridge Methodist Church. The trouble with our church is we've got a lot of 1960s buildings, piles of walls, piles of roof. It, it's a, it's an, an aluminous cement, couldn't be more than a nightmare. My background is a physicist. I've been preaching about uh, the greenhouse effect since the 1970s. Yeah. People howled at us. I wish I'd have worked harder. Yeah. The main problem is I'm utterly depressed by what I see and trying to insulate my grandchildren from my views, but still do something for them is a big problem. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Alan. Um, Hazel? Yeah, just me. Right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm based in North Manchester in Rottenstall. We're setting up a community garden um, and we're doing some rewilding as well. And this is our way of um, contributing towards the protection of the environment. But I think it's also a way of bringing us and the community together. Um, I don't know anything about transition towns and thought it sounded really interesting and want to get more involved in drawing the community into the work that we do. So Great. this is a good way to start. Brilliant, super relevant to what we're talking about. I'm going to be really mean and and uh, and move across Claire and uh, go straight to Alison. Um, yeah, I'm uh, living in um, in Cheshire um, in a village called Cuddington. I'm a retired vicar, um, and in our village church, we're just about to to start going down the eco church. Um, process and I'm going to be responsible for helping to get that or helping to get that going in the church so Brilliant. I'm here to learn as much as I can. Fabulous good luck with that Alison thank you very much. Uh, Anthony? Yes I'm an interloper from the south um, been helping set up a creation plan the last year we think we just got to bronze standard just trying to um, learn what it is to be obedient Christians in this area. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, a, very, a very warm welcome from the South. Um, Ruth. Yeah, hi, I'm Ruth from Frodsham in Cheshire, over to Cuddington. Um, a very small church. I'm the Tear Fund rep and the Eco Church rep, but I'm also just about to become the chairperson of our local transition group. So I don't know a lot about being a chair for a transition group. So I'm here to see if you can tell me anything more, all of you. Um, good luck with, yeah, no, good luck with that one. Um, I mean, as I was explaining in a moment, I'm relatively new to both of organizations, but um, we good luck with that. And we'll, uh, we'll see whether we can help in some way in this session. Thank you. Yeah, Charlotte. 
Okay. Is that move on? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, okay. Issues with microphone. Fine. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, welcome, chat. Feel free to pop something in the chat. Uh, just to introduce yourself. Um, Leslie? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm from the same church as Hazel. So the only thing I can add is that we are hoping to, I, I don't know whether we've already signed up with the Russia, but hopefully we have, and we'll be working towards the uh, bronze award. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And then I've got someone listed as Kate's iPad, Catherine. Hello, yes, I'm, I'm another interloper. I just found you when I was looking online and I would normally be going out for a long walk today around uh, Deerham in Norfolk but I'm laid up with a broken ankle. So here I am and I'm thoroughly enjoying this. So good thing, good things come from bad things. So thank you very much for putting this on. Oh, I'm wow. getting a lot of information because we are just about to start doing Eco Church here in Durham in Norfolk. Indeed, so Echo thank you. brilliant. Well done and uh, Echo Charlotte's comments in terms of get well soon. I wish you, we're sure we all wish you a very rapid yeah. recovery. Um, Gordon? Um. <laughs> I'm from, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Um, I'm from uh, uh, Religious Society of Friends, Quaker. Um, we've got some churches, some tied into Eco Church, and trying to promote and uh, so we can use existing resources instead of, I think, with a lot of people always reinventing the wheel. Um, so at the moment, to find out more and trying to promote it at our yearly meeting in August. Brilliant. So, and looking at lifestyle. That's also very interesting, because, and I do think technology will be part of the answer. But anyway. Yeah, cool. No, a personal interest of mine, that's uh, that's good to hear. Um, okay. yeah, um, <laughs> My my electric vehicle's on the on the uh, on the on the drive currently charging on surplus solar, so it's nice oh, to see not what that might end up looking like. But um, yeah, Chris. Hello, um, I'm church warden in Salford. We've taken the first tiny steps, and I feel totally ill prepared and unprepared. So I'm trying to get a little more prepared. It's Keith, that you started that pilgrimage, you started that journey. Well, I think we're all yeah. at different stages on that. And those are all heading in the uh, in, in, in the right direction and doing that as quickly as we can. That's 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 great to know. Thank you. Finally, Wendy. Hi, <clears throat> Wendy from Clitheroe. Um, I'm here with a, a group, there's four of us on. We're setting up a, uh, an eco church initiative at St. James Clitheroe. Um, I'm interested in this particular workshop because uh, obviously I'd like to pick up some tips for encouraging people into um, different lifestyle choices to help the environment uh, in the community, but also in my own, in my own lifestyle. So I uh, started doing quite a bit of it myself, but, um, you know, any further ideas gratefully received. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thank you for that. I, I wanted deliberately to devote some time to a bit of an introduction, because I think any of this kind of work, whether it related to kind of um, lifestyles, whether it related to encouraging others to kind of consider those ways in which they can reduce the carbon footprint of their, of their lifestyles uh, in terms of community engagement, I think everything starts with a conversation. Uh, and so I think, you know, in this sort of strange world in which we're kind of always engaging with things on, on Zoom, if we're having this as a collective event, you know, as a face to face event, we'd be spending the coffee times having conversations, getting to know each other. So I wanted to make sure that at least some part in this and we can move away with that some sort of sense of having to got to know a group of people and to get that sort of sense about what other people are interested in and to get that very much that sense of, of, of the ways in which we are, um, you know, all very impassioned about uh, making these uh, these rapid transitions ourselves. But let me start sharing uh, my uh, screen, uh, which at the moment is on completely the wrong slide. Um, right, so hopefully, um, hopefully that's all right. Um, give me a thumbs up, someone, if that's uh, brilliant. Okay, so a rather rambling uh, title, but uh, so I was asked to talk about um, transitions towns, which you know I'll be open in, in, in terms of saying I've only been involved in the local tran transitions organisation for the last year or so. Um, and as soon as I joined it in this uh, this era of uh, of Zoom, there's various people, including the chair, who I've yet to have the pleasure of meeting in person. <laughs> so that's something that I look forward to in, in due course, but um, well, hopefully very soon. But so the title is transitions towns, churches, and the role of communities in promoting the transition to a more uh, sustainable uh, future. 
Um, so um, we, we, we're, we're, we'll, we'll sort of shortly complete the uh, introduction. I should introduce myself as well. Um, I'll then provide a little bit of an introduction to, uh, to the transition movement, where that idea has come from. Um, look at the ways in which um, starting to get those kind of conversations and sort of shared activities between different organizations, including the church within the context of uh, Cumbria, uh, which is where I'm uh, based up here in Penrith. Um, then I want to kind of have a go. I don't know whether some of you might have done this before. Something which is, has been developed and is being used quite broadly within the transitions network at the moment is, uh, is the idea of a visioning exercise, which is the idea that, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to try and make progress towards a future that we can't really envision and we don't really know what it's like. So uh, investing some time in terms of exercising our imagination to try and actually, you know, to draw people in to kind of consider what that um, that what that more sustainable future is we want to reach is a critical stage in terms of identifying the steps we then need to follow in order to make it to that to that future. Um, just the opportunity then, hopefully, if I'm allowed time, you know, at the end uh, to, to to consider the role of churches within more of these uh, uh, community uh, ventures, and 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 then a few words on ways forward. I should say I've not got the answers there, but maybe kind of start to talk about some of the ways or the questions that we can address. Um, at this stage. Um, all of the slides will be made available to you in due course, so uh, I'll move through things quite quickly. I will also try to use um, this, uh, this, this thing called um, Mentimeter, so don't worry if you haven't got a separate device, but if you have got a separate device or a phone or anything like that, then this is a nice way of sort of capturing people's thoughts and comments, and then I can then uh, turn those into a file that I can share with people after the other conference. So don't worry if you haven't, but if you have, uh, and I'll, I'll continue to provide you with the uh, the links as we go through, uh, but the, the website will be www.menti.com uh, and then the code 11654071. I guess I should probably um, uh, get, well, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to that in a moment and I'll, 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 get, I'll get that started. Uh, well, I can, I, can, I can start that now, so that's hopefully presenting now. Uh, a little introduction to myself. My, my day job is actually as a senior lecturer in physical geography at Kew University, an institution that's about five years into a plan to reach net zero. Um, but my background, I've, I've spent about the past 25 years of my wife, life working within um, glacial and permafrost environments. Um, so I've become increasingly aware of the accelerating impacts of climate change on the Arctic in particular. Um, and, and that started to, uh, to, to encourage me to actually start to, to look more actively in my own research about ways in which we can actually uh, decarbonize society with a particular interest in sustainable energy uh, and the electrification of, uh, of, of transport. Um, but I guess I'm here at this event today um, in terms of in relation to two volunteer roles I, I have, and, and which I've, I've found in the last year or so, which is firstly as the Diocesan Environment Officer for the Diocese of Carlisle, uh, and then also um, as uh, one of several directors of, of Penrith Action for Community Transitions, which is the local um, transition uh, network movement. So we've had an opportunity to, uh, to introduce ourselves. So an opportunity to move straight to, to looking at transition movement. The transition movement was founded around 2006, I think, by, uh, by Rob Hopkins. Um, and it's very much a community focused initiative. So see, a transition is a movement of communities uh, which are then coming together um, and to try and to reimagine and, and to rebuild our, our, our world. And to we, we keep on hearing about sort of transitions, the need for just transitions, the need for modal shifts um, in so many different kind of contexts. And this is a this is looking at the ways in which communities can be a critical part of driving uh, that transition. And um, all manner of, of different books and resources related to Rob Hopkins that I'd thoroughly recommend. He sort of identifies three key sort of existential challenges for, for society at the moment and, and, the, and, and, and normals that we've got stuck into, which are just not sustainable um, for human society. The first one is the idea of a new energy normal, that we've just become addicted to fossil fuels. Um, concerns about peak oil, we've become addicted to things that are by themselves um, you know, unsustainable uh, and they're finite in terms of resource. You can't recycle petrol and diesel once they're burnt. Um, and we are now, you know, increasingly aware of the environmental impacts of the associated carbon emissions and the environmental impacts, um, as well as all kinds of other related problems related to increasing energy costs and the association of that with, uh, with fuel poverty. Um, obviously, kind of concerns about uh, the so-called new climate normal and, um, and the, the, you know, uh, Maria kind of beautifully illustrated just the, the really shocking 
And this is not a question of things that shall happen in the future. I mean, I come to this as a research glaciologist um, in terms of these things which are happening right now and happening at an accelerating rate. Certainly from my own area, the, 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 the recession and disappearance of glaciers, um, certainly in the UK context concerns about an increased incidence of extreme weather um, and also as well as the, uh, as, as the impacts of, uh, of sea level rise around our, um, around our coastal fringes. But there's a strong economic element as well to the transitions movement and, and concerns about a sort of like a new economic normal that's established where we've got a massive increase in, um, in the levels of, in of inequality between the richest and poorest in society, uh, as well as increased market volatility, volatility and things like speculation on food markets, which then have catastrophic um, implications for, um, for, for, for those in areas of, of food scarcity. So these are seen as the uh, as, as the key challenges, and obviously today uh, has been focusing is, is focusing you know primarily on the uh, on the issues associated with the climate crisis, and uh, this has been talked about you know earlier on. So I don't need to sort of like elaborate on this, but it's quite clear, you know, at the moment we are we we have yet to sort of like level out carbon emissions, let alone get to a situation where we're seeing a downturn in those carbon emissions. So, uh, you know, the, the longer we continue on the existing trajectory and these, these existing normals, uh, the more significant and the more, trans, and the more abrupt uh, and rapid that transition is going to need to be in order to, uh, to have any chance of, uh, of, of not seeing those more sort of catastrophic uh, impacts of climate change uh, down the tracks. So trying to move on kind of quickly. Well, so it's incumbent on all of us um, to look at ways in which we can uh, reduce our carbon emissions. And, and we can do that at a number of different levels. We can do that um, at anywhere from, uh, from the personal level um, all the way through to being part of a, of a global uh, community. And so we could probably look at this and think, well, we've got greater control. You know, ultimately, I can control my own purchasing decisions. You know, that is something which we all uh, have an, an element of control over. Uh, but, um, but, you know, it becomes increasingly challenged as we move down that scale. But then if we're thinking about the significant outcomes in terms of driving down those emissions, then we would end up assuming that if we move towards the larger and larger nations and the global community, that's where we can have the more sort of significant uh, outcomes in terms of driving the reductions that we uh, need. So if we start off by looking at the, uh, the personal and the household element, then obviously in focusing on the... Um, the, the lifestyle element of, of Eco Church, and this is an extract from, uh, from the, uh, the resources part of the website. Then if we look at the, one of the first parts of the, uh, the lifestyle audit, then it says one of the first things that we can do uh, is, to, is to calculate our own um, carbon footprint. So I'm sure that's probably something that you've done, but this is, this is a really great way to actually start a conversation with, uh, with anyone or encourage people to, you know, to give this a try. You know, I think there's a lot of people who are interested in and this can range to individuals through to local authorities. They're, they're interested, they're, they're increasingly concerned about the environmental impacts of climate change, but they want to know, well, what, what do I do about this? And a great place to start, obviously, is in terms of by calculating that environmental footprint and identifying where most of your carbon emissions are coming from. And, the, uh, and this sort of well-known um, carbon footprint calculator from the World Wildlife Fund, as, as I think is a really good um, place to, uh, to, to start. So I'll, I'll start with, um, with, the, with, the, with the first question here, and we'll see whether um, I can get um, Mentimeter to work. I know I have to drop it. I'm used to using in my day job Teams, and so the, 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 the screen sharing um, is slightly uh, different to uh, what I'm used to. Uh, but hopefully, um, hopefully you can see, hang on, now is it my, ah, here we go. Right, I've got to the right page now. So hopefully, There'll be opportunity for those of you who've got Mentimeter to, uh, to uh, if, you if you can't see anything here or you can't use that, then if you maybe pop something in the chat. I'm just sort of interested, this should um, turn into a word cloud if this works. So if you have got a device and you put in www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then put in the code 11654071, hopefully you can see my slide, then there'll be the opportunity um, for you to to make some sort of suggestions about what you consider um, to be the most important lifestyle changes that are required to reduce carbon emissions. And so that might be very much from a personal dimension. It might indeed be your priorities or what, what you think we should be focusing on uh, as a nation in the year of, uh, of, of COP26. So we'll see whether anything starts to, uh, to come through on that. Can, you, can, we, can we see that, Claire? Is that...
Uh, excellent. It's always, this is like, as I say, my, my day job is sort of teaching undergraduates. And so I've come out of a sort of page, a phase of about sort of four months of doing teaching almost exclusively online. And there's sort of, sort of situations where you're waking, waiting, you're waiting for the first response and you're thinking, is this working? Is there anybody there? So it's always reassuring where the first responses come through. So, you know, so focusing on sort of travel in the first instance, and yeah, you know, we can think there about this sort of predilection that people have for sort of purchasing big two and a half ton SUVs, which then sort of drive uh, a mile down the road to pick up a pint of milk. Clearly isn't a, um, an efficient use of, uh, of, 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 of energy in the Earth's resources. You know, thinking about sort of heating, um, energy efficiency uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the heating and the lighting of our homes and, of course, our, um, our, our, our church buildings, where there's clearly um, significant scope for, uh, for, for improvement rates for coming through now. Um, issues related to, you know, our purchasing decisions, our, our choices, you know, food choices, um, you know, concerns, obviously, um, clothing choices as well, you know, concerns about the, you know, the dramatic environmental impacts of uh, fast fashion, for example, um, green belt land, our, our use of our, uh, of our, of our land, certainly if we're thinking about the need to, uh, to try and, you know, really preserve our carbon sinks, both in terms of uh, existing woodland, um, and also in terms of our soils, um, then that becomes increasingly important and issues related to you know, our, our dietary choice as well, the changing our diet, consuming less in the way of red meat in particular, as, 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 as ways in which we can, uh, we can reduce uh, our carbon emissions. Thank you. I'll just leave that running um, for you to, um, to, to, to continue to add any thoughts and comments you've got to that. And then at the end of the session, um, I'll then produce a PDF, which I'll, I'll, I'll pop in the, in the chat so you can down that. And I'll also try to kind of send that round um, in, uh, in, in due course, um, right. So, you know, we've all got particular areas of, of, of developing interest and areas of developing a sort of expertise that I think are great in terms of they can encourage us, they can provide us with ways in which we can start conversations um, within our communities, within our churches, with our neighbors, you know. Um, for me personally, um, I've become increasingly interested in, um, in, in, in micro generation, homegrown energy, if you like. You know, hopefully after this, now that the frosts are gone, I'll be planting some spuds in the back garden uh, but I do like the idea that you know this remarkable transition now that we can actually just put a set of panels on the roof of a house um, with no moving parts or whatever and produce all of the energy you need at many times of the year even in somewhere like Cumbria uh, to run your house uh, and indeed so far this month I've put over 100 kilo hours of electricity into the car which is providing me with about 400 miles of of, 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 uh, of, 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 of transport which are driven by you know solar energy so we can start to sort of identify these kinds of uh, ways in which we can transition towards what clearly is a more you know exciting as, as well as a, as a low carbon future if we switch at the opposite end of the spectrum and we look at the you know the role of nations and and, 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 the, and the global community as a whole in driving this transition then it's very clear that in certain areas if we look at the uk for example we've made significant steps in terms of decarbonizing our energy generation um, with the big increase in the renewable energy generation um, and particularly related to uh, you know recently certainly the uh, the expansion of offshore wind but we can see other sectors in which we just we've, we've made very very little if any progress and you highlighted transport Transport basically is a big sector which is flatlined in terms of its carbon emissions to the extent that as of 2018, uh, it became the most, sorry, 2016, it became the most significant source of terrestrial uh, carbon emissions. And that doesn't even include uh, aviation and shipping. Um, so what Rob Hopkins, and I guess the sort of focus of this session, if you like, if we're thinking about transition network and we're thinking about, you know, our involvement in church communities is the argument is that it's at this neighborhood, it's this middle ground, this sweet spot, neighborhoods, communities, and expanding out to regions, which are maybe the sweet spot in which we can really enact and drive the change that we all want to see. And so just a kind of quotation from one of Rob's books, he said, by, by taking back control over meeting our basic needs at the local level, we can stimulate new enterprises, new economic activity, while also reducing our oil dependency and carbon emissions and, re whilst, and returning power to the local level. So there's a strong focus on localism here uh, and the idea of promoting a local, you know, resilience is another word which is used frequently now, you know, certainly in response to more extreme weather events. 
Um, so the kinds of um, areas of interest, and it's great to hear these being mentioned already, uh, related to uh, the transition network are things like local food production and distribution, um, community gardens that had been mentioned earlier on, uh, waste reduction through things like repair cafes and, uh, and, and encouragement of recycling and, and things like Freegal. Um, great to see some exciting, really exciting developments in terms of community energy projects uh, and even sort of financial elements in terms of the development in parts of the country uh, like the Lake District, like Bristol, in terms of development of complementary local currencies that keep money that's spent in the local area circulating uh, within the, uh, the local economy in order to support these, uh, these ventures. So communities, um, we've really seen a, you know, a, 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 a massive upsurge, I'd say, in the last few years of, the, of, of an interest and an active role of communities within um, issues surrounding uh, you know, sustainability and uh, decarbonisation society. And, and I think as of, this, as of February, I think about three out, 300 out of the 400 councils in the UK had, had declared a, a climate emergency. But just as a little bit of an insight, the, the organization, which I guess, you know, if there's a key take home message, it's if you've not looked out, looked them out already, then, you know, look out for the local uh, transition network organizations with your local area. They're, they're probably a really good group to connect with and, 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 and have a conversation with. So um, the transition network that was founded by Rob, so I'm talking to you from, uh, from Penrith and uh, our local uh, transition uh, organization. Um, is, uh, is called PACT, Penrith Action for Community Transition. So in terms of, uh, of what PACT is all about, the kinds of activities that's been involved with, uh, this just gives you a little bit of a montage of the kinds of activities that the, uh, the volunteers are involved with, entirely voluntary, a community-based organisation, uh, things like Litterfix within the local area to highlight issues related to waste and concerns about the uh, environmental impacts of single-use pl plastics, for example, in this case, around Ullswater. Um, the you know, big focus, there's a, there's a really active group of, uh, of community gardeners who are doing amazing jobs in the local area in terms of uh, enhancing our green spaces. Um, local food production, making use of sort of waste ground, which has just been not been used for any uh, useful purpose at all, being made available to the community, both to grow their own food and then to distribute that more widely within the community, uh, as well as things like repair cafes to deal with the embedded carbon in stuff rather than just chucking it away and buying sort of like the uh, the new version, actually sort of repairing that and uh, and, and and continuing uh, to, to be able to uh, to to, uh, to to maintain the use of, of whatever uh, features, uh, whatever things we're talking about. And then you may well be lucky enough within your local area to then to have a sort of like a broader regional level of organisation where we're lucky uh, within um, with within Cumbria to have Cumbria Action for Sustainability, which has been going since the 1990s. I mean, has a much bigger and, and has you know, in part a paid staff, which is then able to provide much more in the way of support, guidance and advice in terms of things like uh, home insulation, traditional building techniques, uh, micro generation, you know, even now moving into uh, to things like um, electrification of transport and the rollout of, of community charge points, which are, are dealt with on more of a sort of like a, a, a community uh, investment model. And uh, more recently, within uh, within sort of Cumbria, we've had uh, we've been lucky enough to get some um, some funding from the Lot Lottery Heritage Fund uh, to uh, promote to, to support a five year zero carbon Cumbria project. And, and the details of this are not necessarily too important, but what I'm wanting to highlight here is the whole initiative is based around communities. And, and obviously, churches have the the opportunity to play a really important role as 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 integral part of our of our communities. Um, you know, for centuries. But this gives you a sort of sense of the kinds of themes related to these community-based activities, whether they be citizen assemblies and juries, repair cafes engaging the young in terms of youth climate action, um, identifying and promoting low carbon food. Um, you can see here developing community carbon literacy, community energy support, you know, I could, I, I could read on. And, and there may well be organizations or equivalent organizations in your area which are providing um, the ability to, do, to help and help to create and develop and connect um, these different networks that all have these, uh, these shared interests. But I've been gabbing on for a while, so um, I do want to make sure that we've got a, uh, a, some time for, um, so remind me, uh, Claire, how long, what, what, what time are we going to get cut off? I'm just sort of, I, I was pressing things a bit fine in the first session. You don't get cut off because everyone's coming back in. Um, oh, everyone's coming in. What? 
quarter two. So you've got thirty five minutes just under. Oh my word! I, I think I think we've got a bit longer for this afternoon. Do, I feel yeah. like I've got, a little bit longer this afternoon. I've got a little bit more time this afternoon, so I don't have to go at quite such a uh, a, a dramatic pace as I, as I did. And one of the things that's really sort of struck me, and it's great that my wife currently is bringing me in, in, in cups of tea as we speak, so I'm an extraordinarily lucky person, um, is, um, is this visioning exercise. The, the, the Transition Network recently has, has had this project called Transition Bounce Forward, looking at the ways in which we can kind of respond to uh, and bounce back from the, you know, the impacts of, of COVID-19, which are, of course, a, you know, a situation where people in, in a number of instances, rediscovered the importance of community and the existence of community. But a couple of quotations that I found striking in preparing the slides for this, one that, you know, at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. You know, there's been so many discussions about, or oh, we just want to get back to normal. You know, clearly we don't want to get back to normal. We need to actually get to a place which is substantially much better than where we are right now. Um, but in that respect, you know, um, looking to the future, bringing about the world we want to live in, and we're talking about net zero 2030 or 2037 or whatever the date is, um, the world, we, what, bringing about the world we want to live in, the world we want to leave our children, is substantially the work of the imagination. So um, I've got a little bit more time to end up sort of doing this, this exercise. And I say a core component of this recent initiative by the Transition Network is, is a so-called what-if uh, visioning exercise. And um, there's the resources list which are available online, and it's, a, it's an activity that you can run. Um, when it's run properly, it's run uh, over a number of, uh, it's usually run over three different sessions of about two hours each, um, with, with there being three different component parts. What is, is what's going on right now, what are the great things that are going on in our local community we need to sort of celebrate and showcase and we can build on then there's the what if which is what i'll be doing here that's the sort of visioning element you know what is this future that we want to create and then the what next is right okay well if that's the future we want to create then what are the practical steps how are we going to actually start on this journey towards that that vision we want to uh, to see um so i'll stop sharing my 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 slides um here um rather than read out that sort of long section and and it's an opportunity to sort of like relax a little bit now um i'm going to give you just i'm, I'm going to give us um sort of five minutes or so till 20 past two we've got i think got the time to uh to you know to do to do that um and what i want you to do is to over that five minutes and i did this for the first time last year as part of a carbon literacy course it felt a little bit unusual to start off with um is that you know i'd mute yourself turn your camera off probably and then just close your eyes um, and, and spend five minutes just trying to, literally just trying to envision, imagine what that 2030 vision is that you want to create. And try and in that sense to, to uh, in your mind's eye, engage all of your senses. Imagine what, you know, what would you see? You know, what would you hear? Um, what would you smell? Um, and then after that five minutes, I'll try and be quiet when I come back. Then I'll, you know, we'll come back to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back and then I'll have another slide uh, in which we can then sort of share what everyone's, you know, what's key to everyone's visions in that, in that future. Does that make sense? Excellent. Good luck. Uh, enjoy that. And I shall see you in five minutes. Right. Welcome back and see people. Um starting to uh, to drift back so if you um i'll share my screen now if you if you if you are able to access uh, mentimeter then you'll see that there's a uh, another uh slide um in which there's the opportunity for you to um you know to share with us you know what were the key um elements of um your vision of uh, of, of 2030 or if you've not got access to that, or you'd rather, you know, we've, we've got a bit of time to, uh, to, you know, to let this run, you know, for a good sort of five minutes or so. There is one other thing I'd like to kind of discuss later on, but, um, you know, or alternative, if you want to sort of unmute yourself and, um, you know, contribute what you saw, heard, or indeed smelt within that, that vision of, uh, of 2030. You want somebody to kick off? Feel free. So I'm looking at the screen, so I can't use it. Yeah, go on, give it, give it a whirl. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear. This is Alan Monday. What Hi, I'd Alan. Like to see uh, fewer cars, more railways, 
mainline electrified and not all this uh, hydrogen and batteries, which are either inefficient or much polluting. I live in the, uh, under the flight path of Manchester Airport. It's been lovely and quiet for a year now. May that continue. Get rid of interurban flights and more rail from Scotland, etc., into England. Uh, more, I'd like to see more wind generators, solar panels. I'd like to go in houses and see fewer renewed kitchens, put up with the old stuff. Uh, it might not look as good, but it'll last and it's better than people dying due to global warming. Uh, more repairing in this country. If we repair things here, it'll create jobs. It'll get rid of transport from China uh, and uh, more pollution that we've exported to China. Hear things, well, I can't hear road traffic from the local main road anymore, and I've mentioned mm -hmm. aircraft. Smell, hard luck, I've no sense of smell. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, two out of the three cents, you know, two, well, two senses that you kind of talk about is a good start. There, thank you for that, Alan. Um, I'll just read out some of the ones that are coming through and the, uh, the, the hopefully you can kind of see that as well. Um, but it's interesting to hear about your interest, obviously, in, the, in energy and transport, which, uh, which matched my own, Alan. Um, yeah, I think, so again, that sort of sense of no traffic noise. And I think one of the things that people were commenting on at this time of last year was suddenly people became aware of all of that bird song. And there was sort of some interesting discussion about whether the birds themselves were more sort of vocal because they're in a situation where they could actually hear each other um, over that usual background um, noise of, uh, of all of that transport. Um, able to see more, you know, see the stars from sort of cities as well, you know, those things that we can associate with those co-benefits like the, uh, the reduction of levels of, uh, of atmospheric um, pollution, um, you know, a more creative and imaginative world. I, I think it's interesting to think about what that more creative and imaginative world might look like. There might be physical manifestations of that. We've got um, more cycling and electric cars here. So, and we see that, don't we? we? You know, we often think about particular cultures, whether parts of Scandinavia or Amsterdam, where there was a very graphic illustration of people being less reliant on their cars and upon you know making more use of active transport is all of those cycle lanes and the number of people are actively using you know cycles and and, and we've started to see that sort of happen in places like london didn't we in the aftermath of of, of covid whether that's stuck or not i'm I, I'm, I'm not sure so clean air is again something which i guess will sort of come through uh in terms of the um you know again that that, that sort of the the, the increases of active transport and uh, a, a reduction in the amount of, um, of 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 combustion engine vehicles in, in particular uh yeah sort of sustainable green green energy um we've got you know i can imagine you know certainly my vision has pretty much i mean it's, it's depressing for me if i say that you know there's a whole series of housing estates that are going up around the local area um and there is not a single um, solar power, solar panel uh, in sight. In fact, they're currently putting in a new gas pipeline uh, in order to end up uh, supplying the gas to all of those brand new housing estates at a time when we're all being told at the same time we need to move away from gas, which um, yeah. other sources of heating. But uh, let's. <laughs> any, anyone else want to uh, to share any particular parts of their? You know, we got. We I think we've got a sort of like another five minutes or so in which we can identify yeah, any I think, like I think yeah. it is I mean I think it's going to probably mean you mentioned the housing I think last Labour government put in very high standards and the first thing the Tories did under pressure from the was um was remove them um you know the set standards on uh, on on insulation uh, I, my own thing is is energy and that I mean I think a hippie dreaming, we ain't going to get there. I just remember, uh, I know that was somebody told me, um, it was a debt counsellor and he was trying to sort out just before court a package, the thing would agree, the judge would agree. And he said, you've got to get rid of your sky. I can't, you've got to get rid of your sky. Wouldn't have it and lost everything. BB is going to be difficult to get people away. And as much as they know what's happening, so personally, I think um, recycling and um, uh, some of the things that are happening in energy and transport uh, technology, I think, is one of the way forwards. Because if you expect us all to go back on to, um, to as we were 60 years ago, it ain't going to happen. 
Yeah, I think we're going to see the planet go under as soon as they let that happen. Yeah, I mean, one positive, I think, and, and um, for me is that I, I, I think the issue has become far more mainstream in the last few years. And I found that any conversations I've had, there's a there's an intrinsic, there's a far greater level of acceptance and interest. I think acceptance of the problem and interest in the in the in the solutions. I mean, what well, was only a few couple of months ago, wasn't it? Where it was front page news on the Daily Express, wasn't it? In terms of let's work together to sort of like, you know, to tackle to tackle climate change. So I, you know, hopefully we're in a situation where now there is at least that opportunity and that interest to end up, you know, having those sort of conversations in so many different kind of contexts with our neighbours, with other people within the church community as part of services, as part of these groups, uh, in order to, um, you know, in, in order to try to sort of eff effect this, effect this change. But, but thank you very much for, you know, for all of those uh, contributions. There are some other things I want to kind of get through in the, in the 18 minutes that I think um, we have, uh, we, we have left. Um, right, this is where I can't remember which bit I'm just going to share again. Here we go. Um, cool. So in terms of sort of coming towards the sort of final stages and starting to look at the, uh, the, the, the role of the church and the role of, uh, of, 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 uh, of eco churches, then, you know, I was struck by the, you know, the, the, the comments of the, uh, of the students. Um, we, we started off with that, that video of the, uh, of the school students from, uh, from Manchester. I'm highlighting some of the things. What do they expect sort of churches to be doing? You know, they, you know, church grounds as, uh, as, as locations for community gardens, um, for us to be demonstrating the ways in which we're reducing our uh, energy usage. And, you know, I've started working with the two local churches that I go to here in Penrith. And it's, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the energy usage that we're starting off as a bail line is, is pretty profligate. You know, there's plenty of scope for improvement there in terms of, um, trying to move our buildings into a sort of situation where they they demonstrate those changes that can be can be made um, enhancement of biodiversity thinking about procurement you know reducing waste all of these kinds of things um, raising awareness you know it was highlighted wasn't it in the uh, the keynote this morning in terms of i can't remember you know how many thousands and thousands of churches are there are out there and and, and how if there's the ability to actually raise these issues to talk about them then to raise that general level of calm and literacy and the actions that we can take uh, has uh, the you know a, a potential widespread impact impact you know a couple of areas of, of interest for myself which will obviously chime with some people in the in the group um, and, and and this is starting to think about the connections between transitions groups and and churches so there was this case of uh, in, in Melbourne in, in Derbyshire a lo the local transition group held its meetings in a Norman church um, they realized that the uh, the roof above their heads was was ideal for solar PV so they helped to, uh, to, to generate the community letters of support, which then led to the installation of, uh, of a 10 kilowatt um, potential solar array on the, uh, on, the, on the parish church building, which was then able to provide uh, you know, low carbon energy and an income stream for the church, at least at a time when you had feed-in tariffs. Um, and that in turn then stimulated the installation of, of further, further, you know, further solar PV systems within that, um, within that area. And I heard recently uh, at a community energy event um, a situation now um, where there's a church in a village in Sussex, which has got a field adjoining the church. They're going to put a larger solar array, and that is going to uh, to contribute energy to a local microgrid. So it'd be supplying not just the church, but 19 houses that surround that church. So the church grounds, in that sense, being used as a focus for a community energy project. Project. And, you know, a number of people have talked about sort of community gardens and um, that idea that in a number of situations you can end up, this is the church I go to in Penrith, St Andrews, a big green space surrounding the church, bang in the heart of the, uh, of, of the town, um, which is used extensively throughout the course of the year by the, uh, by the community to come in to, you know, to have their lunch and whatever, but where there's clearly the potential for that sort of green space to be um, enhanced um, over time. And, you know, Catherine was talking earlier on that, you know, things like land management, for example, is going to be um, the focus of a series of webinars coming up in the future related to churches count on nature. And I, I can absolutely envisage ways in which these sort of shared spaces and these really important spaces, which are already used by the community, could be the locations in which churches and, and local community groups could be working together uh, to, to look at their um, enhancement. Um, so the final question I'd like to ask, you know, maybe there are sort of situations in which um, these kinds of things are ongoing already, um, but I'd be, I'd be interested in seeing 
Um, and thank you for all of the. I, I, I'll um, once we get him back into the you know, into the main session, I'll download as a PDF and I'll I'll pop this in um, in 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 the in the chat. But the, but the last question um, is: can, can you envisage some particular shared community actions uh, that you like you'd like your own organisation um, to be involved with, or you think will be particularly relevant uh, to your own uh, local setting? So I've given a sort of couple of examples that I've become sort of interested in myself, but and, and those might be relevant to your area, but you know there'll be potentially several others um, in which they might you you might be able to see the ways in which there might be those sort of shared actions that you can that can provide that sort of focus for that community engagement. An opportunity for you to uh, to pop pop that in, or or if you can't see that or can't access that, you know, again, feel free to. To unmute yourself and um, and and contribute something to uh, you know to 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 the discussion. I mean, whilst whilst that's coming through, there's there's you know there's for example the the two churches here that Penrith I'm involved with. I'm interested in sort of exploring the ways in which we can kind of promote you know within the within the the penrith group the penrith action for communities in transition then there's this really active group of um, community gardeners and yet and then also and they're being great in terms of taking advantage of any little bit of green space or indeed you know adding bits of uh, of, of of wildlife into the urban environment through um you know through sort of through window boxes and through sort of planting um, in, in a variety of different locations around the, uh, the town centre. Um, it would seem to be the, you know, a golden opportunity to look at the ways in which they could, could sort of contribute to, you know, development of maybe sort of part of that particular, you know, uh, part of the part of the churchyard. Um, okay, yeah, community gardens, which is, uh, which, which is, you know, and, and this is where we start to think about the, you know, the co-benefits, don't we? The, you know, the, 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 the value of green spaces over the course of the last, 18 months can't be overestimated but then you know you're struck by the number of cases you hear of of the um, for example the mental health benefits of the act of gardening um, for those people who then have an opportunity to get involved in those kinds of community um, you know garden um, initiatives and there was that great yeah so that though thank you I remember these little discussions as well about you know rewilding as that sort of big, you know, that 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 as as, as a big focus, local local electricity, and again, we've got energy production. We, we're talking again about um, yeah, energy production over a large flat roof, which we take over panels nicely, and you know, and it's one of the many illustrations of what um, was being said, you know, this morning by the uh, I've forgotten his name, the CEO for Arosha. Um, when he said that you know all of these technologies, they all exist. You know, they're all they're 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 all they're they're, they're all mature. It's now just looking for those for those opportunities. Uh, to you know to, to to make those happen um and then obviously there's that you know there's always the issues of uh, of funding as well we're a quaker area meeting to start a sustainability group to, to lead us on a journey sustainable future absolutely right i i think um from my own perspective again sort of speaking frankly that we're all we're always impatient for results or so certainly i speak for myself you're a patient for results and 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 we're obviously impatient for results in a situation where we know that the time period we've used up any time that we have and the, there's that urgent need with which to uh, to decarbonize society but at the same time if we want to have genuine authentic community engagement then what strikes me and I'm, I'm not an expert in this area at all is that that needs to start off with conversation and it starts it needs to start off with people to getting to know each other having the conversations, finding, getting to know each other, starting to trust each other, to trust and respect each other's views and opinions, which has become a, a more challenged environment, you know, in, uh, in, in, in recent years. And it's on building those relationships and their networks that can then provide that basis upon which we can build that, make those connections and move forward in those sort of joint, um, uh, you know, joint ventures. So yeah, great to see these ideas kind of cascading through in terms of uh, litter clearing in terms of um, all of those kind of really important recycling schemes, um, batteries, uh, you know, inkjet printer cartridges, all of those kinds of things. Really interesting things there in terms of bulk buying, for example, as well. Purchasing as a uh, as community organisation, 
um, befriending and mental health support, gardening and community. community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wildlife as well. Uh, I can't think of anything we aren't already doing. That's interesting, improving the churchyard with bird boxes, uh, wildflower meadows. You know, it's great to hear that there are a number of things, you know, and, and, and at the same time, I, I think that's really important as well that we, we should identify um, and share and celebrate those, those things that we're doing um, already. Right, so let me find my way back to the main screen and then I can finish off the last few slides that I've got. Um, and then, and then you know, there might be a few minutes left for a, a quick little bit of a, of a natter afterwards. So in terms of the ways forward, it's just really, um, this is a little extract from, uh, again, the lifestyle document from Arosha, which is, you know, it highlights the importance of, you know, um, just, you know, volunteering, networking, volunteering and, and working on, uh, on, on community um, projects. So, you know, some, some ways forward might be to, you know, if you're interested in engaging more within those local communities in order to affect these lifestyle changes we've been talking about, um, trying to map out the local community groups that share uh, our interests in promoting a more sustainable future. Um, and I think, you know, in that respect, it's the local transitions groups, which might be a great place, might be a really good place to start. There is a bewildering number of organizations that are talking about net zero now. Um, but the local transitions groups, if there is one in a local area, uh, might be a good place to start because they, they typically are well connected um, and, and can provide the opportunity for you to be able to kind of make those sort of connections and vice versa with local community organizations. Um, and I'll, I'll flag at the website at the moment, there's the opportunity just to get in touch, to start that conversation, to maybe to share and identify common interests and activities as a way uh, to consider the ways in which you might work together in the, in the future. You might identify that as a case in terms of church grounds, that we have resources such as lands that they can help us to make better use of. Um, and in addition, it may well be that these other organisations uh, may have volunteers or indeed expertise related to microgeneration and uh, community energy, for example, uh, that we might be able to, uh, to, to, to benefit from, for example, if we were looking at doing things like, you know, putting um, solar panels solar panels on churches or, or whatever it happens to, uh, to, to be. So, you know, um, the things I'd recommend at the end of the session would to find out, you know, hopefully I've provided a little bit of introduction to what Transition is about and Transition Network is about. There's a fabulous website um, and uh, one of the links on the front page is to just go to a map to find Transition Near Me. That will provide you with details on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the transition groups which are uh, closest to you. Um, if you get a chance, and I put this earlier on in the chat, there's a really nice, uh, you know, a tremendously empowering, um, a powerful film in places uh, called In Transition 2.0, which highlights, it sort of celebrates a whole series of transitions projects that have been undertaken by these groups globally uh, over the course of the last few years. That was published in 2013. So that's that, that'll give you a flavor for what kind of activities are involved, what kind of initiatives. Uh, and that's a really that's a really nice way to spend part of your your uh, your, your Saturday, uh, and then basically anything you know written by Rob Hopkins, which is one of those relatively few number of people that you've come across that you end up thinking, wow, this is really inspiring, uh, and um, you know it, it helps to kind of to try and you know to to, to cling to that sense of a hopeful future. Um, so he's kind of published a series of books, The Power of Just Doing Stuff, um, more recently from What Is to What If. Uh, and he's also got a website in which he's got access to, there's a whole series of podcasts which are very much on this lines in terms of, well, what if we were able to do this in order to try and encourage us to be able to, uh, to embrace and envision that, that, that future. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end things there. Um, we might indeed have sort of five minutes or so. I can see some people drifting back in from the, uh, the, other, the other sites, but, um, but you know, maybe we've got a few minutes left in case anyone's got anything they'd like to you know, to add as a uh, final thoughts. Yeah, I can see you got your uh, finger up there, Ruth. Yeah, can I just, this, this is, has come from the um, Frodsham transition, which we're now calling Climate Action Frodsham. And we delivered this leaflet, Climate Action Frodsham, um, to um, about over 4,000, five, nearly 5,000 homes. And in the middle, we put things about, this is an idea people could take and adapt nine things you can do, which we took from the Grantham Institute um, in, in London, some university, and then take action and our photos on the back. And we did this, this was my idea last summer, 
we were held up twice because of lockdowns delivering it. We just delivered it when we were allowed not to stay at home at the end of March. Um, and it's gone to all these homes, voluntary deliveries. But, but since it was delivered, I've heard about the Climate Coalition and the Great Big Green Week in September. So now we can contact, we're trying to think of local groups, schools and churches are the obvious ones, but local groups to contact um, sort of on the basis that they should have been delivered this, at least to their homes. And what would, you know, see what, where we can go on from there. So we didn't have um, a major plan in the beginning, but things are developing. That's brilliant. That's, um, that's that's fantastic to hear and uh, well done that initiative. I, I hope that sort of helps to, because I guess with all of these volunteer organisations as well, there's there's certainly within Penrith, that's that sense that there was that initial period of enthusiasm and interest and then it sort of like waned and then there's sort of like that, that, that difficulties in terms of sort of remain, retaining that sort of uh, that, that volunteer base, but, uh, but you know, but signs now of that starting to to you know, to develop, you know, certainly as, as as there's more widespread interest into exactly the kinds of issues around which the movement was sort of set up. So I, I hope that sort of sees a sort of like a you know a, a renewed interest in the uh, in the transition group that you're involved with. Very best of luck in terms of becoming the chair of that. And uh, just an aside on that, I've always thought that you know again, you know, church buildings provide this fabulous. Um, you know, setting for, you know, once we get, once now we're getting back into a place where we can start to think about those opportunities to end up with sort of face-to-face -face meetings, then the opportunity to end up having sort of like events in those locations where you can talk about the things of basics of carbon literacy or explore uh, some of those issues related to whatever it happens to be energy, you know, um, uh, the, you know, transport um, um, decisions related to, uh, to food and other purchasing decisions. So, you know, it's not difficult to envisage a way in which those those church buildings can become the sort of like the space for those for those for those conversations and those events that that, that could end up exploring some of those issues in in more detail. Anyway, I can see that people are drifting back into. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for who's been involved in that um, that session. Thanks for all of your insight. Um, um, and um, I will I will download um, the, the fruits of your labours in terms of the Mentimeter survey now. And pop those in the uh, in the chat so you can download those. But we'll find ways in which we can make those available in due course anyway. So, thank you very much.